There we go. All right, we'll just wait for everybody to join back again. While we're waiting, I'd like to take a moment to plug Sprouts <laughs> Coconut Water. You can get it in your local Sprouts, All right? Shout out to Sprouts. <laughs> hey, Jackie. Hey, Beverly. Hey, Gavin. All right, thanks, so Rob. I'm glad you said something because I didn't notice yeah. it was off. All right, so we got a few people watching now. Um, okay, so we were gonna talk about, hey, Bev, we were gonna talk about uh, basically some experiences we've had with Max in terms of supporting him through some fears and something I think that a lot of parents might want to know. Um, there we go. And <laughs> so Rob says he's packed for the Dominican Republic already three weeks from now. That's, uh, that's pretty good packing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, we're going to Punta Cana in three weeks. So looking forward to that with Global Information Network. That's the shirt. Um, okay, so going back to the point, we're gonna talk about supporting children through fears um, because you know we have a two-year-old, 26-month-old named Max. We also have a three-month-old named Seneca. Um, but Max has been walking through some points lately. And I'm gonna let Katie talk more about it just to kind of intro the point and then I'll give my perspective also. So do you wanna explain? Yeah, sure. Um, so just a little bit of background. We've been, um, now that Max has all of his alphabet built in and all of his numbers, well, most of them, all the way up through 20, um, actually he started saying, have you noticed he started saying 22, 23 just on his own? It's yeah, really he's starting to count past 20 he's now. He's like even. already integrated how numbers work beyond 20. It's really fascinating anyways. Um, but so what we started doing is things that come up in our daily life that we see that are um, things that he needs to have integrated in order for us to discuss more effectively. Uh, we've started putting that into TechnoTutor with him. So one thing that recently came up was that we, well, actually you should talk about it because it happened with, with you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like for example, um, just to give more context in terms of what we've been putting in. Uh, for example, this is something we're still working with him on, but basically um, a few, like a week or two ago, uh, we were explaining to him how to, use the, how to use the toilet. And so he still wears diapers, obviously. And we, were, we have a little tiny training toilet, I guess you can call it that. It's like a little tiny potty that you can just put anywhere and you can empty it out. And we had discussed early on that we didn't want to do potty training from the perspective of training him to do something. We wanted it to be more something where we just explain to him, you know, how to use the toilet and things like that. Um, and then, you know, ex show him how to do it and then have him learn that way rather than it be like a training where it's through like reinforcement or something. And so uh, I'm just bringing that example up because the day that Katie went and put in to TechnoTutor all the words that she was using about you know him using the toilet and the potty and pee and poop and things like that, and then went through that on TechnoTutor with Max, that next day, or same day or next day basically, he went and started using the toilet on his own. He hasn't quite mastered it yet because there's like physical you know skill required to be able to get on the toilet and things like that, um, but he's using it a lot more often on his own, and it's like the resistance to using the toilet is just not there. Um, not that there was a strong resistance before, but it's like we would suggest, hey, you wanna go use the potty? And he just seemed like uninterested in that. But the moment that we put the, the words into TechnoTutor, then it was like suddenly he wanted to do it. And all the things that I had shown him or Katie had explained to him or whatever, suddenly he was doing them. Um, so that's just kind of an example. And so things that we see that there's a, some kind of resistance to, it doesn't have to be a strong resistance. It could just be something that we're suggesting um, frequently that he's not responding to or something that like there is a, a clear resistance. Oh, well, also we've been doing things like if, if I'm doing cooking with him, we'll do a list on the specific things I'm going to be talking about while we're cooking, just so that he has that point as a foundation when we're talking and it, it actually like integrates for him instead of it being just, you know, something that we're something that just passes right through while we're cooking together yeah so it's it just makes it so you can communicate more effectively right. and the child can actually process what you're saying right. um, and there's somewhere in the child 
that in a child's body where that information can be processed and it's not just you making random sounds right. that they don't understand um, so to go back to the original point we were going to discuss I had taken them to the playground I, I pretty much Katie and or I every day take them to the playground multiple times a day to go play and play in the swings and kick the soccer ball and throw the wood you know, chips up in the air throw the wood chips that are on the ground on the air just all kinds of stuff that he likes to do so he's not just at home all day basically and uh, when I took him over there the other day, I've noticed a, a couple times um, there would be like, we would be around other people and there might be like a kid or a couple of kids or something. And sometimes when like a child would come near him, he would start to like, I don't know if, if nervous is the right word, but kind of like he would get apprehensive, like kind of like quiet and he would kind of be looking at them or he might kind of like, you know, shy away. Um, and it wasn't like a shyness. It was more of, you, you could see he was like uncomfortable. Like he didn't want to be around that person for some reason. And I wasn't quite sure what it was, but of course I wouldn't, um, you know, force him to be there or anything, but I would, you know, pick him up and I would take him out of the situation and, you know, he would be okay. But the other day, um, and so we weren't really quite sure what the issue was. Well, we, we just were also observing, just to kind of see, okay, yeah. is this something that, that is turning into a pattern, or is this just this moment with that particular person? What is it? Like maybe, maybe there was something that that person felt or was aggressive, or I don't know. But it, it seemed to be a pattern that was developing. Right. Like a few, It happened a few times where it wasn't with everybody. It would just be with certain people, although... Usually it was with kids, we noticed. Like certain... Like certain uh, expressions from children that were there yeah and it's like I noticed particularly it's when there's children that are not just kind of like um, normal or just kind of like in the moment it's more children who are kind of like watching and like being like sort of like uh, I don't know or, almost like not or, like children they're they're more like they're more like like apprehensive or something or who are super loud or kind of yeah. like um, just doing things very quickly or something like that yeah, because we, we, the way we treat him and interact with him is just very, like, kind of calm. Kinda calm. Yeah. We, we have fun and stuff, but it's calm. Um, we talk directly to him, and he's not, like, used to people, like, being loud or aggressive or kind of in his face or um, just, you know, not treating him the way we treat him. So we weren't really sure if that was the issue or if it was just a matter of maybe there was something really that was going on with this other person that he didn't like, but it seemed like there was a pattern. Um, and we couldn't really quite put our finger on it, but we wanted to support him with the point so that it didn't develop into some kind of fear of being around other children or something like that. And so basically, um, Katie made the suggestion to me because we had done this with other things that we take some of the words like, you know, boy, girl, things like that, and put them in a techno tutor and support him with that. Well, before, before we did that. Though, oh yeah. No, I, I was we, getting ahead of myself. We sat and talked about it the night before. Well, actually, well, last, was I, I was before? getting ahead of myself though, because... Um, the other night, the boy who pushed him. That's oh, right, I mean. right, yeah. right. So, so the reason why it kind of really became a point where we're like, well, we really need to address this is because I took him to the playground uh, yesterday, and we there was a lot. There was like maybe five people there total, five or six people, a couple parents and like some kids running around, and we were playing, and there was children near us, and so and that, up to that point, nothing really. There was no real issues. Um, and then he wanted to climb up this little climbing wall and there was another little boy there and the little boy saw him getting on the wall to climb up and went over and just started like pushing him out of the way. And it wasn't like he was doing it on purpose to be aggressive or, or mean, but it was like the boy I think wanted to show Max like how to climb up it because the boy was a little bit older. So he kind of like, you know, pushed Max out of the way and then Max fell on the ground. It wasn't like he was hurt or anything like that. It was just a matter of, you know, Max fell down and this boy had pushed him. And um, there there wasn't like, I would say, a severe reaction within myself, but there was like a slight, like, you know, I don't know how Max is gonna react. Like, he's, he's obviously not hurt, but I didn't know if it would hurt him, you know, emotionally or psychologically. And so, like, I kind of just step, stopped for a moment, but then he started crying. So I picked him up and I, you know, just held him for a moment and, the the boy's mother came over because she had been like you know like doing some calisthenics or something off in the background 
and she started like berating this this little boy and telling him like you know you need to apologize and she was kind of like raising his voice and you know basically yelling at him like scolding him and i just looked at her and i said you know he didn't mean to do it it's okay and so the mom like paused for a moment but then she looked at the boy and she said well i don't care if you um didn't mean to do it you need to apologize so i could see she wasn't going to de-escalate um, so I just started kind of, I was holding Max, I started walking away from the situation. Um, because when you understand, even at a basic level, how um, sound and, and words, like and, and energy imprints on children, especially in the first three years of their life, you know, that was my main concern actually, was just getting him away from this person who was yelling. It really wasn't the pushing and falling down that seemed like a big deal, but I, you know, her then yelling and everything i was like okay let's walk away and it was interesting because she kept telling him to go over and apologize to us so i kept like having to walk away further away and then eventually the little boy came up behind me and was like had tears in his eyes and i just kind of put my hand on him and i said you know it's okay it, it's okay it's all right it, it's it's all right and then you know he walked away and then i i held max and it was interesting because um max was like it was it was a, it was a behavior I hadn't seen before because he was like he kept saying I want I want I want I want I want I want to go home I want I want I want like that and so I could see there was definitely like it was like a glitch like there was something that was going on within him it wasn't just like okay I fell down that hurt oh well it was like something you know some kind of thing going on so you know I I just held him for a bit and then when that little boy left you know the mother took her, the boy and her other daughter and they left and then Max saw that they were gone and then his attitude basically shifted and I, and I said, do you wanna go back and play? And he said, yeah. So we went back and played a little bit and then he was okay. So, um, and the thing is normally with Max, if he falls down and gets hurt or, you know, anything like where he, you know, like let's say he falls down and gets hurt, like skins his knee or, you know, bumps his head or something, he'll cry for a moment or not at all or not usually not at all but even if he cries i'm saying it'll be like for a moment and we'll be there and we'll pick him up if we need to but it's like then it's over but this it was like there was something else mm -hmm. to it it was like clearly there was there was something going on and unfortunately when a child's that age like they can't they can't tell you what's going on they can't ex they can't explain because they don't even necessarily know verbally what's going on within them but it's like they are reacting to the experience they're having like that energy or whatever the feeling is and so that can be a major challenging point as a parent when your child is clearly either in physical pain but more oftentimes like emotional pain and you don't know how to explain to them like okay everything is okay like this is just what happened and especially when the, the emotions are going and everything and so um it was really interesting because that's something that normally doesn't come up with Max just because we're very specific with his environment and the way we interact with him. And he's he's pretty resilient in terms of, like I said, falling down and things like that. So I could see it wasn't an issue because he had fallen down and gotten hurt physically. Because literally, it wasn't even like he really fell down. Like the boy kind of pushed him out of the way and then Max fell but even caught himself. So it was something else within that. Um, but... So that's just kind of the background in terms of why we, Katie and I started to discuss it because we had noticed him sort of being apprehensive about certain children. But then this point, it was like, it, it was so obvious that like something was going on that I, you know, after I put him in bed, like we took, he took a bath and everything. I put him in bed that night and he was fine. And then I talked to Katie about it and, you know, explained to her like what had happened and everything. So she was aware and then she could also support me in terms of like, you know, well, how should we support Max within this point? So it doesn't become something that's like, you know, um, something that stays within him and becomes sort of like a pattern or a limitation within him later in life that would be very difficult to trace back the root of. Like we want to be as proactive as possible that if something comes up, um, that it doesn't that doesn't doesn't become ingrained in him as some pattern that would be like a limitation later so maybe you can give some of your perspective on you know what we did beyond that point yeah so what we always do with things like this i mean usually it's things that come up you know if something comes up for the two of us we always do our own personal process on these things so for him with this point we both did 
our points on this first. We always do that. So after, like looking at our own, any sort of resistance we had to that situation, any sort of anger towards the mom, towards the kid, anything that's that's just like kind of a remnant well, point within ourselves. Yeah, because I mean, as a parent, like maybe it's nothing that specifically your child has a problem with. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're projecting some fear or some energy onto the situation right. and that in itself could be the root cause it's still going to imprint on your child it's still going to have a, a effect long term so you still have to deal with it but my point is you have to first look at that point yeah. you know like the people that were there did i have a reaction to them was i uncomfortable around you know that little boy or, or the parents or whatever so we have to look at that within ourselves as well and that's part of uh a, a bigger discussion in terms of your own process of well in essence think of it like this like all the things that your parents didn't correct or didn't prevent for you when you were max's age are now going to come up in your adult life mm -hmm. and those are going to be the things that are going to limit you and cause reactions within you and energetic responses and things like that that's going to imprint on your children which is exactly what your parents did to you and my parents did to me and her parents did to her. So it's literally like none of the parents are stopping the cycle and so they just keep repeating it. So that's what Katie's referring to of like, you know, doing the points, meaning we're looking at within ourselves, like, okay, how was I reacting in that situation? How was I approaching this, this situation subconsciously or unconsciously so that perhaps I created a fear or, 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 or a resistance or something. And that's perhaps what, what Max was reacting to. So, so that, that's just, I want to give context on that point. Also, another thing that's really important, because I think a lot of parents walk through this too, is they, they see the behavior that their child has, and then they have a worry that it's going to become a complex, that it's going to become something, which in certain senses, I mean, it could. <laughs> so, but that fear can be a point where then you change your behavior or you may avoid right. playgrounds or you may avoid children or you may you know every time you see a, a kid come up to your kid like you bring them away and you start to get paranoid you stop going to the playground you keep them at home all the time like or you start saying things to them like you don't like doing that or you don't yeah. like those kind of people or, yeah. or you need to be careful around this or or you know like you'll you'll say all kinds of things that will turn into a reactive pattern yeah. response to situations in life rather than you're just clear. Like in the moment, you're just who you are, expressing yourself, no fear, or anything like that. Instead, it's like a patterned response that's really not best for you. It's actually limiting the way you interact with people and everything. Right, because you're isolating yourself. You're not actually seeing that person for who they are. You're not listening to them. You're not really hearing what they're saying. You're not hearing who they are as a human being and their expression and you can't support them in the moment like you know what I'd like to be able to do and we have done this in many situations but I'd like to be able to when we're out with Max also support other parents to be aware of what they're doing be aware of how they're speaking to their children be aware how, of how they're speaking to my child so yeah so that's what we did primarily before we started We're still here. <laughs> Just drop them. I caught it. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So before we started doing it um, with Max, before we started working with him directly, we uh, did it for ourselves first. So that th there's an extensive point behind that, but that's, that's something that we're developing and perfecting. So when we work with Max, um, what we did is we looked together at what are the, what are the, what are the types of things that we'd like to be able to talk to him about uh, when we're in situations like that, if something like that were to occur? And what are the type of words that we would use? You know, what, what would a list of words be if we were going to talk about, okay, we're going to the playground, we're going to see kids there, there's going to be parents there, you know. Like you don't want him learning about children from just the experience of being pushed. Right, like where the word child is now associated with being pushed down or children being aggressive or something. So what we did was we went into our techno tutor and built a list of words for him to integrate so that those words are within him without any sort of emotional bias. 
Um, and that's what Techno Theater is doing is it's, it's imprinting the words with, with, without any emotional bias. So that way, when you communicate, the child can actually process what you're saying. And it's not like relating it to some memory or something because we wanted to be able to explain to him, OK, when we go to the park, there's going to be other people there. And sometimes there's children and sometimes there's parents and sometimes the parents might be talking loudly to their kids. The children might cry. Sometimes the children will play and throw things or they might um, push you or they might want to come up to you and play. And they might, you know, like we want to be able to just explain to him and have him understand the context of, of what he's going to experience or what he might experience. So that way. Or even in the moment when yeah, it's happening, yeah. we can explain what's going on. And it's not all just being imprinted in that moment from that experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then so now maybe, Katie, you can explain because you picked up on it more than I did because I guess I was probably just more with him, like playing with him today. But we went to the park in, uh, in, in, in Houston and we played. We like kind of went out today and had some it dinner a, and stuff. And we, It was a park we go to all the time. But today... And, and we, again, we didn't do this, we're not intentionally trying to test this point. We just saw, we integrated all these words and then we saw, okay, now if we were to go to the playground, we can talk to him. So today we went to the park, which normally there's nobody there. And I didn't even consider that it's Sunday. It was packed full of people, like all kinds of people doing, like there's tons of dogs there. There were tons of kids there. There were people doing like um, like dancing to music and like playing guitar and doing yoga and like doing all these different kinds of things that maybe he never even had seen before. And it's not a big park. No, it's, it's just it like a very... small park next to one of the art museums here. It's not like a big park where there's just like tons of space. It's like a small park. So you're near all the people. You're not going to be able to avoid being near people. And there are all types of different people, different looking people. So it wasn't just like your ordinary park it's i mean it's very eclectic well yeah that area at montrose people. and houston is very like bohemian right? right so yeah so it was really interesting because within myself i was like okay well we just worked with him on this so i'm not going to have any expectations that he should absolutely just die you know go right into this area if he wants to go over here there's an area i kind of scoped out that there was an area where we could take him where there weren't as many people if we kind of needed to gradually get into it but he was walking with Cameron and he was insistent on going to this swing that was in the middle of all of these people. It was in the middle of the park, surrounded by people. In fact, there were people already on the swing and he was just not even hesitating, wanted to go there. And afterwards, he sw you guys sw swung on the swing a little bit and then we walked around. He like interacted with other kids, this other kid that was blowing bubbles. Um, yeah, like there was little kids that had bubbles and he was going up over there and like wanted to like look at the bubbles and he kind of wanted to get the bubbles and blow them himself. But I was explaining to him, you know, those are their bubbles like we are just going to watch. Um, and there was people like with like hula hoops and he wanted to grab their hula hoops and like well, he was people, just asking people juggling and like, like he was like he was like, I want the purple one, you know, and I was like, well, right that's up. theirs. We're going to he was going watch. right up to the people and like touching things. And yeah. it was just really which is which is normal yeah. like that's a normal behavior we're but not saying it's anything extraordinary but the point is over the past couple of days we noticed this point where there was like we said this pattern it seemed like developing where he was becoming apprehensive around certain people and so like like katie said we did some work within ourselves on what's where is that resistance coming from within ourself you know because like i'll admit in the past i've had sort of an apprehension around being or about being around other parents and children because they tend to just yell at their kids like they tend to unconsciously be honestly really mean to their kids and like control their behavior and 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 like max is watching that right so that was one of the points i worked on for myself was how am i when i'm at the park with max or in a public setting like withdrawing within myself and becoming resistant to the situation because i'm like looking around, judging everyone, like not wanting people to say anything around Max and everything. And that's not allowing me to be expressive and really be present in that situation. So that was one of the points I looked at. And today, obviously, that was a, a major shift. Well, it was a different point for me because I wasn't experiencing myself in that same way. But also, it's funny because I, I didn't really even notice until Katie pointed it out afterwards, like when we were leaving the park, that, hey, show me that list that you did with Max because I want to see like what you actually worked on. So I showed it to her and it was like pretty cool because when we were at the park, 
he wasn't having any resistance to anybody or anything like we had seen before I mean, over the nothing. past couple of days. So it'd be like what you would expect to be normal. So in even, other words, even though there were loud dogs like running up, you know, lots running of up dogs, and barking, yeah. there were kids running all over the place. Like Anything that up. you think might be there to be like a stimulus that might um, make a child uncomfortable, like in you know, in, in the way we would normally think about that. None of that had any effect whatsoever. It was just we were having a fun time and Max was there. Yeah, so it was, like, yeah. it was like everything was back to normal, if that makes sense. Whereas because, because this point with him um, you know, showing a little bit of apprehension around kids was kind of a new thing. It wasn't like he's always had that. It was just like we started to notice it over the past few days. And that's another point just so people understand like how aware we are of any little tiny change in Max's like oh, – yeah facial expression or mood or behavior anything because number one katie's always with him and generally speaking i'm always with him but you know obviously i'm out of the house more and you know on calls and, and working and stuff like that but the point is we're always there and he's not in daycare he's not in school he's not with babysitters he's not spending time uh, apart from us with relatives or anything like that we're always around so we can see any little minute change in his behavior or anything um, what what did you want to say? I was just going to add to that. It, that's something that we agreed on, you know, when we found out that I was pregnant with Max, is that we were going to make that commitment in those first three years to be with him because we wanted to be able to guide and support during that crucial period anything that could come up and support ourselves through it too because if you miss if you miss something. And a fear is developed from somewhere else because your child's off with someone else and that person's not yeah, in line. You won't even you. know what it was to be able to address it because they're going to be pre-verbal. So I'm be able to explain it to you. Right. And having worked as a tutor for a long time, I would be able to see – because I would work with students sometimes for six or seven years throughout like their education, you know, the same student. And – I would see how the rift between them and the parent would like slowly widen and they would drift apart more and more from their, from their parent. And, you know, because there's all these things going on where the child is not with the parent. And I'm not saying something can never be away from their parent, but especially in those first three to seven years, it's extremely important that the parent is really with the child as much as possible. And, you know, having a parent full time staying home is, is ideal because they can really form a bond with the child and obviously both parents that's really great too so i'm i'm with max a lot and we'll do the same with seneca um keon was asking a question says do you read the definitions um no typically not because you know max is only two so he's not gonna be able to process all of those definitions necessarily um so but that's that's a about... specific question for technology yeah, we do explain to him what words mean uh generally speaking and like we'll explain when there's different context for a word like we'll for example lots of like physical examples too like so for people yeah. he got lots of examples of people today yeah or like uh the word right is pretty interesting because we were talking to, like when we talked to him you know you don't you take for granted a lot of things as a parent how much you say to a child when they don't have the context to fully understand and sometimes a child will they'll like give an answer to a question and then I'll notice the the like immediate point within myself is to correct the child or correct max or correct the child and say like no no it's this but what I'll do is I'll stop myself and I'll ask him again and I'll make sure that I understand what he's responding to so I, I can't think of an example at the top of my head but there's been many times where like I've asked a question and he's given an answer and then in it wasn't correct or it didn't make sense in the context of what I asked. And so I would kind of probe a little bit more and then I'd realize, oh, he's talking about something else, like something he sees or something I was talking about previously or something. And so it prevents it. It prevents us from basically like unnecessarily correcting him or, or making him feel like I just said something wrong when he didn't like it wasn't wrong. And it's not to say you shouldn't correct a child because there's plenty of times where, you know, like in the beginning, Max might say that car is purple, but it was actually like dark blue. And I would say, yeah, that looks purple, but it's actually dark blue. Look at it. Can you see? And then he would say, oh, and then he would learn what dark blue was, for example. So there's definitely a time and place for correction. But I noticed a lot of times 
um, especially when other people are around, they'll be very quick to like correct something that Max says. But I, since we're around him all the time, like we see and we understand words that he uses. For example, that other people might not understand the word just because of the way he says it. So I'll explain to him, oh, no, actually what he's saying is this. And they're like, oh, wow. So then I think about, for example, if you were to take a child and put them in school or daycare mm-hmm. and like, when especially when they're, especially when they're pre-verbal or, or in the beginning or like yeah. for at least for the first four or five years, I mean, I'm not advocating that you put your kid in school ever, but at least for the first four or five years, the problem is that the, the adult in the situation is not going to know the child like you would, assuming that you're there full time, always with them and so forth. And so, um, oh, so so the point I was going to bring up was about the word right. So I've been talking to him about the word right. And actually, we'll do that in Technotutor because I haven't done that specific word yet because it just came up today. And I realized, hey, I need to be able to explain something to him. And I'm realizing that I know he doesn't have certain words. And so I'm limited in how I can get him to understand. So you mean like left and right? Yeah, like... I've I've done those in two. Oh, you've done left and right? Okay, good, good, okay. And straight and back and forward and... Okay, good. Yeah, because I've been talking to him lately. And although it's funny you say that, which actually makes sense because... Well, he's integrating it. Well, he's he's learned it so quickly. I just, I wasn't sure that's why I brought it because I was like, well, I'll definitely make sure I go and get those words in there. Because... And so you have to really catch yourself because like I'll, I'll be asking him when, when we're walking, for example, I'll say, Max, do you want to go left or right? And he'll say left or right. And I'll know he knows what I mean because he'll look to the left or to the right when he says it. And I'll ask him like, which one is your left hand? And he'll pick up his left hand. Which one is your right hand? And I mean, realize he's 26 months old. I'm not even sure if that's normal for a 26 month old. I don't, I, I'm sure it's not. I mean, they say in the, in the psychological research that children don't even learn most of their colors until they're three. So I really doubt they learn left and right at that age. But in any case, um, I noticed how when I would say, which one is your left hand? And he would, he would pick it up and I would immediately go, that's right. And I'll be, no, wait, that is correct. <laughs> Cause I'm like, wait, hold on. Am I confusing him? Cause he doesn't necessarily have this kind of like, uh, context that I do like that. Right. Can be used in different contexts. So I was explaining to him, Okay, Max, so the word right, there's many different contexts. It can mean left, it can mean it has a context of direction, but it can also mean something is correct or truthful. So, and then you have to think as a parent, how do you explain that to a two-year-old? Well, here's how. You have a tool, TechnoTutor, we're actually able to integrate vocabulary before you explain it. And it really works like that. He understands what we're saying. So that's why when you watch these videos of him, where he's doing things that you're like most four and five year olds don't have that self-awareness or that verbal ability it's because of the tool that we're using that's why he's mastered his alphabet completely i mean visual symbols not just like he doesn't even know the alphabet song no he, he we didn't teach him that but he knows the alphabet like when we go like i when you were in the car nursing seneca today we were he, he max and i kept walking down in the park and there was a, an architecture or an architectural firm that had a sign out front and it was in the, the letters were in yellow. So he was like, I want to go look at the yellow letters. So I took him over there and I took some video. He was just standing there because the letters were like on this sort of like metal frame. And he was looking at him going A, B, R, you know, just looking at them. So even at 26 months, he's noticing letters and words and stuff that most children would not. They would not even understand that that's a part of their environment. Just like if someone's talking Chinese behind you and you don't speak Chinese, it just sounds like noise. Um, but to him, he now sees other things in his environment. It's like his ability to process it is higher. So he's like more calm. He's more aware. So we can explain things to him and, and he cooperates more. And you'll see that in all the videos. Um, hold on. Just real quick. Did you want to say something? Oh, I was going to add up, sum up the point about like fear, but we can. Well, I just want to look at what Danielle's at saying. Sometimes oh, people. I want, to, I want to respond to this. Hold on. Sometimes people can afford to keep them out of. Can't afford. And some people can't afford. And then, okay, so. Sometimes people can't afford to keep them out of childcare. Okay, I want to. I want to talk about this. So, what's the specific point you're going to talk about? Because not everyone can see. No, you're referring uh, uh, to. Okay, I'll read it. Sometimes people can't afford to keep them out of childcare because you were talking about you don't necessarily advocate putting them in care and things. I yeah. think I think that is totally true uh, in some cases, but also I think you know young people aren't necessarily supported to understand how expensive childcare can really be. So it's like we don't really we don't really support 
our our child our children when they're becoming parents to understand like hey look if you're going to be planning your life if you're going to be planning how to make income together like what is childcare actually going to cost you and if you're just going for the lowest common denominator childcare what is that going to create as consequences for your children so a lot of times when when I've talked to people when they sit down and actually look at the numbers they can sometimes find a way to be able to be at home so just to put that out there because I mean it's different for everybody's situation but it's like if it only if, if it's like you have to really look at okay if it's just for three years even if it's just for three years if you can get it from when they're born until three that is a crucial time to develop a bond with your child and for you to develop like their actual foundation of their mind and how they're going to develop their identity and their personality i mean all the research is very clear on this yeah. of like it's the zero to three so if you can do it during that zero to three do it you know and if you need support on like sitting down and looking at numbers like sit down and and, and really look at it like we can do a video on but, that too. But hold on like, but here's the thing though like you know we'll probably have to talk more about this because it's a separate topic yeah. but it kind of ties into what we're it really ties into what we're talking about whether you can afford daycare or not what I, what we're suggesting just to make sure it's clear is not to put your child in daycare um and if the argument would be that well but i have to go to work well let me ask you a question how much are you spending on your child's daycare right. and how much are you earning because why isn't one parent – and this is maybe a broader question for our world, obviously. I'm not judging anyone in, as an individual in this sense. But why can't one person make all the money and one person stay home? Because if you have to have two people working um, just to be able to make ends meet, that's a, that's a serious situation. And I understand a lot of people are in that situation. And I'm not saying don't put food on the table. But a lot of times – but a lot of times it, it seems like that's the situation and it may not even well, be. That's where you have to really look self-honestly right. is, is there a belief within myself? Like I have to go get a job and that's just, that just makes sense. And then I, and therefore I have to put my child in daycare. Like, have you actually sat down and done the math and looked at the fact that, okay, I'm spending $500 a week on daycare, but I only make uh, $1,500 a month. Well, how does that math make sense? You're, you're, you're earning – or even if you're making $3,000 a month, that's only an extra $1,000 a month when you take away what you're paying for childcare. So is it really worth it? Um, and, and also you know, to weigh into that, when you're looking at that, again, you sit down with your partner and you look at all of that. But you also look at like, okay, what are the consequences? What are, what are things that – could be consequences if I have someone else raising my child and from my perspective like those consequences are very high look at the so. long-term point of for example let's say you put your child in daycare because you have to save money but then because they're not with you full-time and you're not making sure that they're getting an effective education in that very beginning stages where they're building the foundation for their learning ability because every time someone uh, punishes the child or hits the child or yells at the child or expresses any sort of like intense emotion at the child or doesn't that, even doesn't even properly understand what they're saying yeah so. or or corrects them unnecessarily or incorrectly mm -hmm. um, that is going to diminish the child's learning ability and then they're going to have problems in school later on if you choose to put your children in school and so you're going to have to end up doing some kind of remedial stuff or, or you're going to have to do yeah or therapy at some point or ADHD medicine um, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I can't talk about medical aspects of things, but a lot of these problems that I've seen with children who I've worked with directly is they don't really have a problem paying attention because when they're doing their video games or they're playing lacrosse or football, they're totally focused. It just comes to when it comes to schoolwork. So it's an academic point. It's like they're not fully focused and they don't really understand their coursework and their vocabulary is so deficient that it's hard. It's actually hard to understand when in fact, the information that we're taught in school, every child should be able to master it if they were supported effectively from the very beginning. But the most critical period is those first three years. Um, and a book I would recommend everyone look at is a book called 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain by Dana Suskind. Um, she's a PhD. No, I'm uh, MD. Yeah, she's a cochlear uh, implant surgeon. And she talks about all the research that's been done about the first three years and about if how if you don't get that done properly 
your child is basically screwed. Yeah, and there's there's tons of research on that. Too, it's it's like a, it's like an established fact. But and, nobody and, talks about it. Nobody really actually fundamentally talks no, about it. Well, like, no, why? Because because <laughs> here's why. It's easy to throw money at improving a school mm-hmm. even though it has no effect. But how do you change the environment of the child in the first 3 years? Cuz that means you have to change the parents. Mm-hmm. And there's no well there that's is, what we're talking that about. That is what we this do. That's what we're doing. <laughs> but what we're saying is in terms of what the system is going to promote, okay? The system is not going to promote uh, – Danielle says what book? It's called 30 Million Words. 30 Million Words by Dana Suskind, S-U-S-K-I-N-D. It's a very good book. Um, the system is not going to promote what we're talking about in terms of the parents changing because let's just face it. At the end of the day – I mean, we could sit here and talk for seven hours about all this. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the system as a whole needs people who are dumb. It needs people who are sort of dumb. It needs people who are sort of smart and people who are really smart. It needs that stratification of society. Um, that's why the education system was designed the way it was. Because you had to take people out of an agrarian society and put them into factories and put them into corporate jobs and have managers and have workers and have supervisors and have factory workers and have janitors. The industrial model doesn't work if you don't have workers. But we're now entering a point in our world where automation and artificial intelligence are going to basically remove the need for most of those types of uh, manual jobs or repetitive jobs. I mean, just look at some of the – you could just go on YouTube now and look at all the different types of robots and AI and everything and what peop, what they're able to do with technology now. It will blow your mind. And yeah, that's correct, Jordan. 30 million words by Suskind. Um, so what I'm saying is like if you look at the system as a whole, it's not going to promote this approach because it's there's so much inertia within it. And I think if – here's another point to look at. See, See, there's so many different points of context here. Think about this. Why do parents think that both parents have to work? Is that something that you actually came to as a conclusion on your own? Or is it something that's been programmed into you as a belief? Well, that's something I've been studying. Because think about this. If you look at the point where mothers, on average, started entering the workforce, you know, instead of staying at home and raising the children. And look, before anybody thinks I'm trying to be anti-feminist here, the father could stay home if he wanted to, okay? He can't breastfeed, so, you know... That's going to be an issue. But my point is a parent needs to stay home. But when you get both parents out of the home, number one, that means you can put the kids in school so they can be taught whatever the party line is. Whatever the people in power at that moment in government want children to be brainwashed with, that's what they're going to be able to control them with. So you have children going into the factory schools. But then you also have two parents working and paying taxes, which means everything can become more expensive. So which means they have to print more money and charge more interest and all that stuff. And look at the house uh, the price of houses since like the 20s and you see how everything starts growing go, going up and up and up. And back in the day, you could have somebody – like for example, we have a friend, uh, Susie. Her dad worked on the factory floor for Henry Ford back in like the 30s or whatever it was. And he was the only one who worked and he had a middle class income working in a Ford factory and put all of his like – three or four or however many children through private school, you can't do that today, right? So this is a problem. Um, so when we're talking about this stuff and, you know, Danielle brought up a really good point about, you know, not everyone can afford daycare or not everyone can afford to keep to their kids out of daycare stay home, or yeah. stay home. Like I empathize with that point. And, but a lot of times, again, like we we're saying, it's, it's something you've been sold as an idea. And if, if you sat down, but again, it's like hard because we've never been, we weren't taught. I, you know, I was just thinking about this today. There's no parenting class in high school. Like you're not taught how to sit down and plan a life, even though the, the most people, a lot of people go on to have kids and to be in, in a marriage or a relationship or something like that. And, and we're not taught how to plan. We're not taught to think, okay, like I want to plan my life so that I give my kids the very best and I can have someone who stays at home at least during those first yeah. three years. But that's not going to happen in school anyways. Well, again, because – And that's why we're talking about what It's not going to happen in school here. because the foundation in those first three years wasn't set properly. So 
all you're doing in school is memorizing stuff. You're not actually learning anything. That's the bottom line. But you're not any learning case, anything. There's no there's no there's no support in our society for parents to actually look at the practical solutions for their life. Because again, it's it's just it's well, you were talking about how it's propaganda. It is. I'm going to I'm going to talk about that in another video because I've been doing a lot of research on like how women were the the propaganda that was used to get women out of the household and also the whole idea of like being anti stay at home mom, like really pushing that hard um, for women to integrate that point of like you don't want to stay at home. You're going to you're going to go crazy, you know, like you're going to hate it, you know. It, you're going to lose your whole identity if you stay at home. But anyways, that's a whole nother Topic. But it's important, you know, right. so so there's a lot of context to all this. That's why we created that um, education is evolution page. We'll be putting this video on there. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I wanted to oh, just yeah. I want because we've been talking for a while. I just want to sum up uh, like really what we realized within this. Well, and what we've known, but it was cool to see it, how quickly it, it had an effect with Max of you you face the fear or the thing that could become a fear the thing that could become a complex in the child you face it head on you, the parents support themselves within it and then you support the child using techno tutor and so very quickly we turned it around where he is able yeah. to go in, in such an extreme situation too i mean again we did not plan to take him somewhere and force him to be in a situation where he has to face his fear. We just No, we were just going to go to the park and didn't even realize there was going to be a lot of people we there. We went to the park. There was a ton of people there. We had the point of we, he could have gone somewhere else. He chose to go right yeah, into the it'd middle be like, of It'd be like if you had a fear of jumping into the pool and the pool is like three feet deep. So you do some work on that with your techno tutor. And then you're like, okay, let's go to the pool and just kind of sit by the pool. And then suddenly it's like, the kids jumping off the 10 meter high dive mm -hmm. and you're like whoa like okay not only did we support with that little pattern or that fear that was that was going on like it like totally changed everything mm -hmm. and the thing is we've seen this so many times i mean it's funny because i should expect it by now because we've seen for ourselves how much we've been able to grow with our process with techno tutor and everything that we've been walking with but also everybody else that we've worked with and have been working with the changes that people have gone through i guess we'll probably have to do more videos where we have oh, yeah. other people come on and talk about that oh yeah that yeah. would actually be cool too because it's not just us like we talk about it because this is our life but it's not just us there's lots of other people but the reason we're so amazed okay is because we weren't taught how to parent our parents didn't know how to parent they're just doing the best they could and most parents are just trying to hold on to do the best that they can. Yeah. But when you actually start to investigate how children develop, how their minds operate, how it works, what actually occurs in those in those years from zero to three, and because we use TechnoTutor, we're able to read this information very quickly and integrate the information very quickly, discuss it with each other, and we can see how like what we're doing with TechnoTutor is exactly how a child's mind should be structured like we're and, and and how parents can parent and how they can parent better because we should push each other to do better like we shouldn't just accept the lowest common denominator of parenting and just hope that our kids are going to be just fine because you can look around at this world and see that that's not good enough yeah the reality is whatever 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 point you're coming from, like whatever your belief is, whatever your mindset is, everything, that's not really who you are. That's actually just the the circumstances, the happenstance of your birth and the way our system is designed. That's how you've been programmed. That's the that's your lot in life, if you will. And what we're suggesting is we could actually change this world so that every child being born into it is able to maximize their potential and get the best out of life. But that's not going to happen on its own. It's not going to happen through just intentions or uh, willpower or, or just wishful thinking or hoping or believing. It's going to happen by understanding how children are actually educated and how the foundation for their, for their 
communication and their self-confidence and self-esteem and everything is built in the beginning of their life and how as parents we have to take responsibility for that and that means we have to go beyond every single perceived limitation that we that we believe that we have and nothing is a valid excuse at all in this what were you gonna say i was gonna add that you can't just sit around and talk about it either like you can't just sit and listen to this video and and just think that oh okay all right i've got it figured out like no if you're not hold on if you watch this video and you're getting amped up and that sounds really cool and you're feeling good about it, but then you're not using TechnoTutor, you're not doing this process. I mean, I guess keep watching these videos until you get to that point where that's what you're going to do. But that's the point of it. Like we don't want followers just so people can listen to us talk. Like we, we have to make ourselves do this. Like otherwise we just want to live our life. But we know other people need support. Right. And it, it, it's supportive for us to see other people showing an interest in it. But at the end of the day, you need to be doing this. And what I'm saying is you can have a child where their abilities are far accelerated, perhaps even beyond where Max is, because that's just where we're at. Um, really, I think that if people will take what we're doing and then apply it, be, you know, and understand it even before they have kids or and so forth, they're going to go even beyond what we're able to do. That's what we want. We don't want to be the best out of everybody. We just want to be the very best that we can literally physically possibly be. But we want to support other people to go even beyond as far as possible. And I know it's possible. It's just a matter of preparing yourself before you have kids. If you already have kids, doing everything you can now. Listen to what we're saying, but also question it and become a part of what we're doing because you're not going to figure everything out just from one video or from reading one book. Like we're talking about between us – decades you know at least the past 10 12 years mm -hmm. of research and study and experience and, and experience and 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 hard uh you know overcoming fears and limitations and pushing ourselves and expanding beyond what we we're able to what we thought we were able to do and that is based upon other people's experience and so forth so this is not like something you can just do really quickly overnight it's going to be a process and you're going to have to face fears and so forth but our whole purpose here on this earth is to support as many parents as possible so that we can have a new generation of children that is able to take this planet and transform it into what it could be. Maybe it can be done in our lifetime. That would be nice. But at the very least, we want to prepare children now so that they can look at the problems in this world and they can put systems in place that actually gives to everyone equally so that everyone can have an effective life. And that when I say equal, just so we're clear, that doesn't mean down to the lowest common denominator. When I say equal, I mean equal to everyone's full potential. It's a totally different type of equality than what you're probably thinking when I say that. So we're saying raise everyone up to the highest possible standard because then we don't need to try to impose any kind of utopia or authoritarian anything. It'll be a natural expression of everybody taking self-responsibility for their lives. But that's not going to happen if we don't support our children in the best way possible. Because, you know, they say children are the future. It's not true. They're just an exact copy of you as a parent. So if you weren't the future, I mean, think about it. They've been saying that for how long? How many generations have gone by that weren't the future? It's just a copy of the same shit over and over and over. I saw this article the other day on Facebook. It said, um, it was like a fashion thing. It said, uh, low rise jeans are making a comeback. And I was like, next up, bell bottoms. I'm like, it's just the same shit repeating over and over and over and over. Like, do you want your kids to grow up and wear like bell bottoms? And I mean, it's like just an example of how literally nothing is changing. We're not really evolving. Things are actually just getting worse in this world. It just looks like things are getting better. But in reality, look at the actual thing, the events going on in this world and look at the relationships, relationships amongst people. People are growing apart. You know, and we want to be able to use things like this technology to bring people together, not grow apart and not to create distance between people. Um, there's a place for it. We, we have smart technology, but we also want to have smart people. We don't want to live in, you know, dystopian communist China where everything you do is tracked and every action you do is. Day. Jordan, thank you for sharing this. Uh, motivates me even more to do TT every day and earn more so my daughter can get the proper environment hey, education. That's why we're doing this. Right. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. So we really appreciate everybody listening. I guess we'll leave it at that. Um, but we'll do more of these little informal talks. This, we, we talk like this all the time. So, But yeah. it was a really cool point. Um, so you can deal with your fear with your kids. Like deal with it so that it doesn't become an issue. Uh, face it right away and do it with technology. If you have any more questions or anything, comments, 
or any if you want any support if you have techno tutor and you need support well call us talk to us directly yeah but uh otherwise comments or questions you could put on the video and i'll oh, respond yeah. to them maybe we'll do videos based on it if there's something you want us to do a video on put a comment but please like like the video and share it because that means more people will see it right and that way we can get a bigger and bigger community of people who are actually implementing some of these things that we're suggesting and and we can learn from each other as well so again we're just two people in this broader movement of really taking humanity to the next point of evolution and that's only going to happen through education from the very beginning of life so thanks for watching and we'll see you next time bye